For those of you who don't know me, I'm Ben Weinberg. I'm another GI medical oncologist at Georgetown Lombardi and the Rouge Center. And this session is on expanding immuno-oncology therapy. So this morning so far, you've heard a lot about targeted therapies. So the sort of dovetail to that is always, well, when you talk about the immune system and sort of other ways of targeting things, but on looking at an immune focus. And last year we talked about, you know, expanding checkpoint inhibitors. Can we get more mileage, more success outside of the microsatellite instability high group? And as we've already seen this morning, these checkpoint inhibitors work well and they work exquisitely well in MSI high cancers. And they work to some degree in some other GI cancers like upper GI cancer, hepatobiliary cancers. But they are not game changers in the way we want them to be like they are in melanoma, lung cancer, and other diseases. So the focus of this is really looking at checkpoint inhibitors, but really beyond checkpoint inhibitors as well, in different ways we can target the immune system to go after these tough-to-treat cancers. Uh, and that's all I'm going to say. Otherwise, uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the first of three uh, outstanding speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Mitchell Ho. Dr. Ho is a senior investigator and the Deputy Chief of the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Head of the Antibody Therapy Section, and Director of the National Cancer Institute Center for Cancer Research Antibody Engineering Program. He has pioneered the generation of therapeutic antibodies targeting cancer-associated heparin sulfate proteoglycans. He received his bachelor's degree from East China Normal University, his master's from San Francisco State University, and his PhD from the University of Illinois. He completed his postdoctoral fellowship at Ira Passon's lab at the National Cancer Institute. So without further ado, Dr. Ho. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to give a talk here. Uh, it's really my pleasure to uh, update our work in National Cancer Institute. Uh, the title of my talk is CAR T Immunotherapy for Treating Liver Cancer and Other Solid Tumors. But in the rest of 25 minutes, I'm going to talk about uh, the how we define the tumor antigen in liver cancer, and uh, and we build on that and uh, extend it to other therapy and other target in other tumors such as pancreatic cancers. And this is my disclosure. Uh, uh, I have patents and uh, belong to the NIH, and uh, we get funds from the industry to help us to translate our basic research in the lab, uh, move to the drug development. So there's a lot of challenges in, in obviously for immunotherapy, particular uh, CAR T therapy uh, as uh, in solid tumors. So as shown in this figure, the CAR T cells need to get into several uh, biological barriers uh, into the tumor microenvironment. So one of the first barrier were encountered the biophysical barriers called extracellular matrix. And, uh, and then obviously there are a lot of immunosuppressive cells and immunosuppressive molecules we need to deal with. Ultimately, the T cells has to target the tumor cells. So the tumor antigens are critical for CAR T cell immunotherapy. But unfortunately, there are not many so-called tumor specific antigen in solid tumors. And it's, those targets are particularly rare. And so we spend a lot, a lot of time in the lab try to identify such tumor specific antigens in solid tumors. In the last over 10 years, uh, my lab has been focused on a group of protein called uh, glycans. These are hepansulfate proteoglycans on the cell surface, and they all have a core protein and uh, glycan chains uh, anchored on the cell surface by glycolipid called GPI anchor. And some of these members has more than two hepansulfate chains, but they all have at least two, uh, like a canonical glycan chains, but they also have up to five, like a GPC2. So we started liver cancer many years ago. At the time when I built up my own lab in NCI, I want to look, uh, because my, I'm a biochemist by, uh, by training, uh, and also uh, get a PhD in immunology. So I want to use my skills and knowledge to try to benefit the cancers because we are NCI. And we find that not many people study liver cancer antibody-based therapy uh, in the US. So we look at the microarray and we find GPC3 is one of the highly elevated antigens in liver cancers. And that might be druggable because it's on the cell surface. 
And, and in more recent years, we actually uh, find that GP2 is also another member in this family, highly expressed in pediatric cancer, like a neuroplastoma, it also in the medulla plastoma and other pediatric cancers. I'm going to talk about uh, later in my talk. And in the end, I'm going to touch the GPC1 that is relatively new in the lab, and we find that it is uh, high in pancreatic cancer. So uh, in general, our laboratory research has been focused on to identification and the validation of uh, glycans as a new therapeutic targets in solid tumor. So here is uh, one of the first study we did. We spent a lot of time trying to identify an uh, antibody called YP7. Now it's widely used in many labs uh, worldwide. And that's the antibody. We could stand the tumor cells uh, specifically and not any normal liver or adjacent normal liver. So if you look at uh, uh, normal tissue, you know what I mean specific because it really does not bind any normal tissues like essential organs, heart and the lung and uh, uh, kidney. So uh, those are the organs we worry about, and uh, and those this antibody has no binding, so which is good. And uh, biologically, when we studied the uh, GPC three, and uh, we did a lot of research focused on the wind and the YAP signaling, what we find is GPC three uh, uh, somehow elevated in liver cancer, actually in early uh, cirrhosis liver. And uh, uh, one third of cirrhosis liver actually had a high GPC3. And more likely those cirrhotic liver will grow, uh, will actually evolve to become like HCC uh, tumor. And though the GPC3 ideology of how GPC elevated was not so clear, maybe related to the chronic uh, inflammation of the virus and, uh, and those uh, infections, but it's not so clear. But uh, uh, when GPC3 elevated on, in the liver, uh, they actually tend to bring the more wind and beta catenin signalings to the liver and uh, it somehow play important role in liver cancer pathogenesis. And we spend a lot of time trying to identify the where wind binds on the GPC3. Actually, we find the wind bind to the... Uh, so this is wind, it binds the phrasal like this and, uh, and the, the GPC bind the other side of the wind and to strengthen the, the, the complex. On the other hand, the guy can also like a glue to help them to uh, stick to each other between the wind and the phrasals. Uh, the, the other mechanism involved, uh, and I don't have time to explain more. And for example, it also prevented the uh, phrasal front degradations uh, by binding to the us body, another uh, moderator in the wind. So in general, we can say GP3 play important role in wind and the YAP signaling in liver cancer. So when translate those, uh, uh, bio biology of GPC3 uh, and the liver cancer into a clinic, we, we, we start to work on the CAR T cells. So the CAR T cells mimic what the TCR does. It actually has a variable region, uh, replace variable region from the antibody, replace the TCR variable regions. It still have CD3 data. On the other hand, in addition to that, uh, we actually introduced CD3, CD4, uh, CD28 and the 4 bb co stimulant factor to enhance the TCR signaling. So this is our car. It has a single chain FB, which is a antibody fragment, and, uh, and then followed by hinge from CDA and, the, and CDA transmembrane domain, followed by co stimulant factor and the CD3 data, that's for TCR signaling. We also has a human EGFR truncated form, not a whole human EGFR, just the epitope recognized by cetuzumab, so we can remove the CAR T cells in the patients if we no longer need it. So it's like an off switch. Uh, we did a, a multiple, obviously, a lot of mouse models. Uh, here, we, so we just show one mouse model and uh, that's something we learned from our preclinical study. The first lesson we learned is, and uh, if we target uh, the tumor antigen like uh, GPC3, one epitope close to the cell membrane, the other epitope of this distal from membrane is far from membrane. We find that the CAR T cells targeted the epitope close to membrane is more potent than the one targeted the distal epitope. And it's just show the mouse study. And the dose dependent, the one targeted the membrane proximal epitope is more potent than the one distal epitope. So alpha fetal protein is a marker. We can follow the liver cancer patient in mice and humans. And Obviously, we look at the wind. We find that the wind actually is 
uh, down regulated when we treat with CAR T cells. As you show, this is HCC patient uh, T cells. If we treat the tumor cells with HCC patient T cells engineered to express CAR on the T cell surface, you can see the beta catenin signal in the tumor cells significantly down regulated. Why this is important? In, important is it's not only wind to play important role in liver cancer progression. Wind is also a resistant mechanism against the uh, CAR T cell therapy. So by doing this, we could actually show the, uh, the CAR T cell not only just kill liver cancer cells, but it's less likely to be resistant uh, to, the, to, the, uh, to the CAR T cell therapies. And the other things uh, we want to uh, look is the so-called single cell based uh, polyfunctional T cells. So that is, we, we take the CAR T cell from the mice and look at the single cell based T cells and look at the immunophenotyping. Uh, so in that case, we use the bees and, uh, and capture those CAR T cell single cells in a microfluid device. And those are the chemokine cytokine we use to, to capture those cytokine chemokine from the individual CAR T cells. And by doing this, we could actually uh, monitor the CAR T cells on the individual cells basis, single cell basis, and some of the CAR T cell, for example, on single cell basis, it actually is, uh, produce granzyme B gamma interferon, proforin, TNF alpha. It's a uh, they, so is, this is just from one single CAR T cell. They could produce multiple uh, cytotoxic cytokine and chemokine. So what, that's what we call polyfun polyfunctional CAR T cells. So apparently, a very small set of CAR T cells in mice are highly, poly highly uh, functional. And, uh, and probably sufficient to, to the tumor curings. So this is actually quite interesting because uh, that means if the CAR T cell need to work, some of the CAR T cell, because we put the CAR T cell like a pool uh, in human animals, right? So we have no idea and uh, how, what the CAR T cells work, what the CAR T cells do not work. So we spend a lot of time trying to distinguish functional versus non-functional uh, CAR T cells. And we are doing a single cell RNA seq to further analyze those genes regulate functional and non-functional CAR T cells. And the other things we actually look, we learn from our, our colleague working on the HIV, and we find that the, 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 the gene in, uh, integrated in the, the CAR T is the transgene. It's integrated T cell genome, and, uh, and, the, and the location might be important because we think that those CAR T cells are persistent in mice, and enrich the, uh, under the selection pressure in the tumor microenvironment. And those integration sites might be important for the, uh, the, 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 CAR, the CAR T uh, expansion and, the, and, and activity in mice. So we use the, the tool, normally our colleague in NCI, to identify the way HIV virus get into the integrity in the T cells, the same method we use here to do the next generation sequence. And we find that in this case, multiple mice uh, at a different time point, they could enrich the certain uh, T cells, uh, uh, like integration side on the T cell genome. For example, NUPL1 is one of them. And uh, this site is actually enriched between five weeks or seven weeks after CAR T infusions. That indicated this is uh, under the kind of selection pressure, those CAR integrated into this site may be more active than other sites. So we call it a hot spot. And, uh, if we know that, we probably would be eventually engineered the CAR T cells using genome editing to make a more potent CAR T cell and more homogeneous in the future. And then we could use less dose uh, in the patients if we know this more and more about how the CAR integrate into T cell and what hotspot might be the most potent for those CAR T cells to survive and be very active in the tumor microenvironment. So those are the tools we developed to follow the CAR T cells in the genome. Obviously, we can do this when we start, the, uh, actually we are doing the clinical trials so we can analyze patients uh, T cells in the same method. And uh, so this, the CAR T cells I'm talking about, we are running a clinical trial, uh, the phase one clinical trial in NIH this year. And uh, we are looking for actually uh, HCC patients. Uh, we welcome people to refer to their patients, HCC patients to our trial in NIH Clinical Center. And uh, we, the phase one study is ongoing. And uh, so 
uh, that uh, we really want to spread the words, and uh, this is the cartilage uh, therapy we are offering in NCR clinical center in a phase one clinical trial. So build on the GPC-3 story, and we in more recent years, we start to work on GPC-2, actually, and uh, we find that the GPC-2 might be a, a new target in neuroplastoma. That is, the when, when we look at the GPC-2 expression, more than 50% of neuroplastoma samples has GPC-2, and uh, is correlated with patient survival, which, which a high expression has a poor survival. And uh, like a GPC-3, we look at wind, we find that we, if we knock out or knock down the GPC-2, we see the downregulation of the active beta cartining. And uh, interesting is, we find one of the targeted gene is called NMIC, and uh, which is known as an oncogenic driver or neuroplastoma pathogenesis, it's also downregulated. And uh, that is quite important. And uh, to actually, in this case, we actually look if we could find a so-called epitope with a highly tumor specific by just doing rna seq So we look at the rna seq analysis using the uh, uh, patients and the uh, uh, healthy donors. So we find that the GP2 has two isoforms, GPC201 two, two or 203. In, interesting is, if we look at those exons, the exon 3, for example, exon 10, especially exon 3, is highly tumor specific, meaning it's almost absent at the RNA level in any normal tissue except uh, testis. So testis is the only one you can see the RNA level expression of GP2, nothing else in the, at the RNA level. That's a really very high tumor specific uh, uh, epitope uh, on this target, the GPC2. So we want to uh, use that knowledge to develop a highly tumor specific antibody. So that's the antibody called CT3. So we find that this antibody indeed, we isolate many antibody. We find this antibody indeed by the exon three and, uh, and, uh, and the shows is, uh, it might be the one we, we, we really want because we want sensing find the so-called tumor specific exon on the tumor antigen, in this case, GPC2. So we think this method could actually apply for other tumor antigen. If we want to improve the tumor specificity of any target therapy, we could actually look at the RNA uh, isoform and also look at the exon of a particular antigen and try to narrow down to something which is highly tumor specific and not absent in the normal tissues. Apparently, a lot of tumor antigen have different isoform and they will contribute to, to such a tumor specific epitope. And indeed, if we look at this antibody and probe on the tissues, tumor and the normal tissue, we can see indeed it bind only uh, testes, not any other normal tissues. And in the, in the tumor model, and we do the osotopic model, we put the neuroplastoma in the adrenal gland, and uh, that's the osotopic model, you can see the CAR TCL actually shrink the tumors very well. And this GPC2 trial is also going to start in NIH Clinical Center uh, next year, 2023. So for that, I obtained the cancer moonshot grant to support the GPC1, uh, uh, GPC2 phase one clinical trial. Okay, in the last uh, several minutes, I think I'm going to talk about GPC-1. Uh, GPC-1, we, we actually look at the GPC-1, like a GP-2 and a 3. We find the GPC-1 in pancreatic cancer is a high expression, but not in any normal pancreas cells we actually uh, got from our colleague, and uh, they immortalize the normal pancreas cells as a cell line. And uh, again, just like GP-2 and a 3, it still also activate the wind, if you put a GPC-1 in a report assay, you measure the, the, the signaling of the luciferase, which is under the, the, the promoter of the beta, beta cartini, and you can see the impre, uh, increase of the signal just like GPC-3 as a control here. Same as GP-2 and 3, if we knock out GPC-1, we could see the beta cartini signal significantly knocked down, even more than GP-2 and 3. It's because the GPC-1 uh, turnover rate is much shorter than GP-2 and 3. It's only several minutes versus like GP-3 is a couple of hours, hours. GP-2 is a half hour to one hour, and GP-1 is just several minutes. So we actually measured the turnover rate in the, cell, uh, uh, the intracellular turnover rate and the uh, 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 intracellular trafficking and those things. And uh, to make a GPC-1 antibody, we use a hybridoma and uh, we use a phage display to screen on the camel live on it. So we made a larger uh, geometry camel, one hump Arabian camel uh, phage library, 
And uh, we use those libraries to find the nanobody versus uh, the, the antibody. And the nanobody has a better transduction efficiency, easy to express energy and engineer. They usually can cross species, mouse and human. They could bind to the berry side because they are very small, unlike uh, conventional body. They usually can do bind to the cavity and the groove, which ligand usually binds. So that, that is very attractive. And, uh, and the, the affinity is great, is sub nanomolar affinity, the, the nanobody. It binds both mouse and human GPC1, as I said, they, they, so they tend to be cross species because they, they bind the conformation sensitive epitope. They usually bind to the cavity. They don't really care too much about a, a linear a sequence of the target uh, antigen. And we made uh, several CAR T cells by different engineer the hinge and the transmembrane domain to try to see which hinge and the transmembrane works best with our nanobody because our nanobody is relatively new. We, so we don't believe the conventional hinge and the linker and transmembrane works best with our nanobody. So we engineer those part. And we find that indeed, I just going to tell you that uh, the IgG4 hinge with CD28 transmembrane domain uh, works best for our nanobody. That is the GPC1 uh, uh, the nanobody called D4. So that's red here. So all the others are just less potent. We try all different hinge and transmembrane domain. And again, it inhibit the, all of them inhibit the beta catenin signaling, just like we showed in the GPC3. So they all actually correlate with winter signal in different cancer type, but they all target the wind. And uh, so the best uh, uh, construct, that's IgG4 hinge and the CD28 transmembrane domain, indeed also work in mice. And uh, so uh, most of the mice survive uh, in the end after week 10, that's a pretty long uh, treatment. And uh, so that indicating this uh, the hinge and the transmembrane optimized the CAR T cells works best uh, for our nanobody CAR T. So that's very important. So the lab is building more and more nanobody technology. So we're using more and more nanobody CAR T cells for future uh, CAR T and cell therapy. And this is just the one of the first example. So we show the nanobody CAR T cells works well. And we, so we do have other projects also use nanobody and try to engineer them. And, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and why it works better? Because we found it on the Western blot. So the, the IgG4 CD28 tend to have a more dimerized uh, car. So just like TCR. So, uh, so it's more dimerized. Actually mimic TCR even better than normal CAR T. And uh, as we show here in the structure uh, modeling, and uh, you can see that the nanobody uh, based the CAR T cells form a better dimer and more protruding out to the tumor antigen on the tumor cells, they actually more closer to the tumor cells because it's more uh, protruding and stick out. Now, on the other hand, uh, the intracellular part is also more structured uh, for TCR signaling rather than the original one. And uh, they are less structured and uh, it's not optimal for TCR signaling. Uh, for those TCR signaling, you need a ZAP70, LCK and other molecule to bind well. And this is a stru more structured uh, substrate for those um, uh, important signaling molecules in TCR. Okay, so with that, I would like uh, to thank uh, obviously all the members, the past and uh, current members in the lab. They, uh, we have very talented and hardworking PhD, MD student and the postdocs, clinical fellows, uh, medical student, and, uh, and the, all, uh, over the years we have both from clinical and the basic science uh, uh, people come to the lab working on the, our basic and the translational research in the lab. And uh, on the other hand, we get a support from NCR intramural program. We get a moonshot grant to move us uh, our work to the clinic. Otherwise, there are no money to move to clinic unless we have uh, moonshot support and something like. And we also collab with companies through so-called Crater. So they will actually bring our uh, technology to the clinic and uh, by uh, collaborations. So with that, I would be uh, very happy to answer any questions. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, Dr. Ho, for that excellent talk. We'll try to do some questions at the end of the session. Um, I had never heard of Camel Phage Library, so you, tr you truly learn something new every day. Um, and very exciting that that strong preclinical work is finally making its way into the clinic, which is an excellent transition to our other speakers who are going to focus a little bit more on the clinical applications of these similar technologies. So without further ado, our next speaker, Dr. Kim Rice, is an assistant professor of medicine at the Abramson Cancer Center at the University of Pennsylvania, 
where she joined the faculty after completing her residency and fellowship training at Johns Hopkins. She specializes in the treatment of pancreatic cancer and has led multiple clinical trials, including those using PARP inhibitors and immune therapy for this disease. It's all yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ben. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for the, to the conference organizers for inviting me to speak today at this, uh, at this wonderful conference. Really excited to be here. Sorry I'm not here there in person. Today, I'm going to be talking about novel immunotherapy strategies for pancreas cancer, but also extend it a little bit to other solid tumors. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus on two specific trials, um, demonstrative trials that I think will be interesting to you. One was published earlier this year, and the other is actively recruiting right now at Penn and also at four other sites. And what's different about these uh, studies as compared to, as Ben said earlier, kind of just the run-of-the-mill immune checkpoint um, blockade that we previously tried to use in our GI malignancies alone with some success in some spaces like upper GI cancers, but overall not as successful as we wanted it to be. Both of these studies use immunotherapy in novel ways, hopefully paving the way for the future uh, for these difficult diseases. So the first study I'm going to talk about is, um, is one that we ran at the University of Pennsylvania, but a little bit of background is required before we jump in. So um, for those of you who don't treat pancreas cancer, our, our paradigm for disease treatment for patients with metastatic disease uh, is essentially chemotherapy for life. I call it perpetual chemotherapy. And the reason that this paradigm was was uh, developed is that until 2001, not very long ago, we basically had zero therapies that were effective at all. And so the entire focus of, um, of work was to try to find a single drug that might actually impact the survival and, and pa in patients. So not until about 22 years ago, 21 years ago, did we even have any treatment. So nobody is thinking about what to do after treatment if you don't have any treatment at all. Then in 2011 and 13, the more modern chemotherapies that we still use today, fulfirinox, enzymcytabine, nampaclitaxel, were developed. Um, and still, the progression-free and overall survival of our patients was not exceeding a year. And so we still didn't really have enough um, you know, therapy, enough good therapy to think about maintenance. And so any patient that was lucky enough to do well on chemotherapy, we sort of shrugged our shoulders at a bit and just continued on treatment, um, modifying it, dropping drugs, you know, trying to shape it for, for tolerability. But essentially we treat patients still uh, until progression or untenable toxicity clinical decline or death. And over the um, last couple of years, there has developed or has come out a subset of patients who do so well on chemotherapy, and this is pancreatic cancer, so so well um, doesn't mean 15 years. It means maybe they're on chemo for a year or two years or a year and a half, something like that without progression. But that's enough time that the toxicities of chemotherapy really start to take a toll and you have to think about a different strategy. So we proposed an alternative paradigm for these patients, which has been done in ovarian cancer and lung cancer before us, where basically you use the chemotherapy as an induction treatment, a way to stabilize the patient, get the disease burden under control. And if the patient at that point, whether it's at six months, four months, six months, 10 months, 12 months, 18 months, um, the patient still has not had disease progression, then that person might have a unique biology and therefore might benefit from something different. And maybe we can get those patients away from cytotoxics and use something different. So this was the, the first study that explored this was a big um, phase three study that you probably are aware of called the POLO trial, where a small genetic group of patients, so those with germline BRCA mutations who had metastatic cancer and had uh, platinum-based chemotherapy, so fulfirinox or cisplatin and gemcitabine for at least four months, some short, short term, but, but four months at least with demonstration that their disease has not progressed. Um, their chemotherapy was discontinued and they were randomized to olaparib, which is a PARP inhibitor or a placebo drug. And the results of this trial, the primary endpoint was an improvement in progression-free survival. And that endpoint was met, which is shown on the left side. The light blue line is the patients who got um, olaparib and the, the red is placebo. And it did meet its primary endpoint and actually was FDA approved for that indication. Um, but as you can see on the right, did not change overall survival. So survival was not changed, but progression-free survival was. If you take a little bit of a closer look at that Kaplan-Meier curve on the lower left, you'll see that you can kind of with your eye divide people into three different groups. The group all the way on the left plummets, right? So from 
in the first four, four months, so basically first scan cycle, about 25% of patients drop off very quickly. Then there's a middle group that seems to do well from about six months to maybe two years. And then there's a, a final group of about 25%, maybe a bit less, that have years of benefit. And, and that was really interesting. It means really that we don't quite, that even in that tiny narrow group, we still don't have a, uh, enough of an understanding of the biology to figure out which patients would really benefit from this therapy the most versus not. And that's something we're still struggling to figure out. Um, the group was extended a little bit with a, um, so that's a maintenance therapy now, for a non-cytotoxic maintenance therapy for a small group of patients. Patients with BRCA1 variants represent perhaps, perhaps somewhere between three and 8% of patients with pancreas cancer. We then did a smaller study at the University of Pennsylvania, where we expand, expanded the genetic group a bit to those with BRCA or PALB2 mutations, so people with a somewhat broader group of variants, and we gave them Rucaprib, same design, no chemo for four months, no progression, stop the chemo. We did have a, a single-arm design, so patients were not randomized to a, to a uh, placebo pill, and all the patients received Rucaprib, which is another PARP inhibitor. And similar to POLO, we identified a, a, what looked like a pretty clear benefit to these patients with a, a pretty major improvement in quality of life, which was really, um, really important. And these studies um, both led to NCCN, uh, POLO led to FDA approval and the Recaprib study led to NCCN guideline change. So patients with BRCA or PALB2 variants are eligible for this, but that's still a very tiny group. So how do we expand on the number of patients who are eligible for maintenance therapy? There was a preclinical paper published back in 2015. Um, the senior author was Sarah Adams, and this was in an ovarian mo model, a DDR uh, deficient ovarian model. But she compared giving PARP inhibition plus PD1 versus PARP inhibition plus CTLA4 therapy in an animal model. And she uh, identified that there was synergy, T cell mediated synergy between. Uh, PARP inhibition and anti-CTLA-4 that was not observed with PD-1 therapy. Um, and that sort of led to the, the, the idea that perhaps we could do something a little bit audacious and try to uh, use platinum sensitivity rather than genomics to identify a group of patients who might benefit from maintenance treatment. Maybe patients who are doing very well on platinum have some kind of underlying DNA damage repair issue. Maybe that's the hallmark. Maybe that's why those people stay on chemo for so long even without a BRCA variant identified. And so we did a trial where we allowed any patient, no, no molecular or genomic feature required, who had had extensive or at least four months of disease-free survival on, um, on a platinum-based regimen. And we stopped chemotherapy, just like in POLO and in the Recaprib trial, and randomized patients to either get a PARP inhibitor and PD-1 or a PARP inhibitor with CTLA-4. Um, these were two independent trials. The, the arms were not being compared to each other. We were looking to see what the progression-free survival would be if we uh, did these two agents. The reason that I brought up the Sarah Adams paper is that people are a little bit scared of using CTLA-4 because of its higher level of toxicity, but it was that paper that convinced us that we should also try that combination. And as you'll see, we're very happy that we did. So ultimately, we um, had 44 patients that we analyzed in our efficacy analysis in the niraparib with PD-1, uh, the PARP PD-1 arm, and 40 in the PARP CTLA-4 arm. And as you can see at the bottom, three were still receiving treatment in the PARP uh, PD-1 uh, arm at data cutoff, and eight were still receiving treatment in the PARP uh, CTLA-4 arm. And actually, at this point, um, all the PD-1 patients are off, and I think we have six that are still on who, are, who got PARP and CTLA-4. This very quickly, this is a busy slide, but really just uh, showing you that when we analyzed these folks, there were no differences in their demographics, their ECOG status, their measurable disease, their stage, their a couple had DDR variants in each group, no significant difference between them, KRAS mutation um, uh, frequency was identical between the two, uh, as was neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio. So no, no differences between the patient groups. And we identified that uh, niraparib with CTLA-4 uh, provided a, a progression-free survival of approximately eight months from start of niraparib and CTLA-4. So eight months away from chemotherapy um, and a, a PFS-6, uh, basically a con disease control rate at six months of 60%. And at 12 months, one in three of those patients was still away from chemotherapy without disease progression. Interestingly, niraparib with PD-1 completely 
tanked, to be honest with you. Um, those patients did not do well at all and had a progression-free survival of about two months, which is essentially consistent with other trials uh, where no therapy um, was given after chemotherapy, you know, ineffective therapy or no therapy after stopping chemotherapy. So this is just one of our patients who's on this trial. This is a woman without any germline variant. Um, no, no, she has nothing known. Um, she was developed, she developed metastatic disease in 2017, got chemotherapy for a long time, first full Fearnox, then maintenance full theory, and then ultimately enrolled in the study. And she is four and a half years on the study with a complete response and nothing is visible. Her pancreas lesion, her liver lesions, nothing is, nothing is there. Um, she was randomized, as you might expect, to the neuraparib and uh, ipilimumab arm, the CTLA-4 arm. So what are we going to do next? So this, you know, we don't really know exactly why we observed what we did. Um, we just know that we made this observation. We did publish it in Lancet Oncology. Um, and, and of course, a lot of questions about why and how can we figure out why we saw what we did and how we can exploit it further. So we have a large number of immunological studies going on looking at PBMCs. Um, uh, you may be familiar with the PRINCE trial, the the um, flow cytometry panel, the Parker panel that was done on that trial, which identified a signature in patients who did well is being run on these patients as well. Um, and then John Weary, who you may have heard of, is also working on looking at the T cells of the patients specifically who responded and who didn't to see if we can identify differences there. We're doing whole exome sequencing of the patients and their tumors. And then we have an ongoing mouse model um, to further examine and figure out why PARP inhibitor and CTLA-4 might be um, kind of a magical combination, particularly after platinum induction, that might be part of the key. So a lot of that is cooking right now, um, but suffice it to say, it's really, I hope we figure out what the what it is so that we can move forward and, and do better at the next time. In the meantime, of course, we're working on the next clinical trial, um, as well as um, looking at other novel drugs for to use in maintenance uh, therapy. Okay, so with this for the second half, I'm going to flip to an entirely different uh, subject matter. This is a, a study that we have op open right now at the um, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as for other sites. And this is a completely novel first in human study of chimeric antigen receptor macrophages, never been done before, CAR M, for patients with HER2 amplified solid tumors. So as you know, and as was uh, mentioned at the prior talk, um, CAR, CAR therapies, CAR T-cell therapies have been incredibly successful for liquid malignancies, but their efficacy has remained somewhat limited and elusive to date anyway um, in solid tumor cancers. And as, again, as you heard before, some of those major challenges uh, have to do with honing and penetration into the tumor bed, the immunosuppressive microenvironment of solid tumors, and inherent resistance to target antigens due to heterogeneity, and then also antigen-negative progressive disease. So what about using um, reprogrammed macrophages instead of T-cells as a way to combat solid tumor cancers? So one advantage of using myeloid cells is that they are actually naturally very abundant in solid tumor cancers. They're not always anti-tumor. There are kind of two main subtypes of macrophages. Some are uh, anti-tumor, those are called M1, and some are pro-tumor that are M2, but there are, they are abundant in the tumor. And additionally, in preclinical modeling, adoptively transferred macrophages hone readily to the solid tumor microenvironment. So you can get them to go back to the tumor. Macrophages have uh, specific anti-tumor anti -tumor capabilities, which are shown on this slide, namely tumor infiltration, phagocytosis, cytotoxicity, and induction of inflammation and T-cell recruitment, as well as obviously antigen presentation. And CT, the, the product we're using is called CT0508, which is a HER2-directed uh, CAR macrophage that's generated from, uh, that's generated uh, autologously. So it's patient derived from uh, patient monocytes. Basically patient monocytes are collected by a plasmapheresis, and then they are terminally differentiated into macrophages in the lab, after which they are transduced with a HER2 directed CAR via a viral vector. And the same vector, which is ad, uh, called AD5F35, locks them also into that M1, that anti-tumor phenotype, so that they cannot flip into M2 and become pro-tumor. Uh, those uh, CAR Ms are then frozen down and uh, sent back to the site where the patient is, thawed at bedside and re-infused. So I think um, first we should talk a little bit about the preclinical data. I might have gone, I might have skipped a slide. Some must be a slide hidden somewhere. Um, but basically, uh, and sorry, the slide is uh, not appearing, but basically the Charisma Therapeutics team 
um, published xenograph data showing that human CAR macrophages are effective at controlling tumor growth and at promoting cell, uh, animal survival. So basically, and again, sorry, I don't have the slide. I don't know where, where it disappeared to. Um, but basically, they, they took a, a xenograft model. They implanted tumors into animal flanks. They confirmed via IHC that they were HER2 positive. And then they introduced either transduced macrophages untransduced kind of regular macrophages or a vehicle into those uh, into the xenograph model and uh, the the data essentially showed long story short is that the um, the transduced car macrophages greatly reduced tumor growth and also prolonged survival pretty dramatically it was also shown preclinically that they really do modify or they do preclinically modify the tumor microenvironment. Um, again, this was on the slide that has vanished, but um, it, we, we identified that they increase CD8 uh, T cells and that basically you can see that in the untreated tumor, the CD8 T cells are not there. And then in the treated tumor, CD8 T cells have appeared. And then finally, uh, it was not, that you know, it's just not just T cells, you want activated T cells. Um, and, and they did find that there was a significant increase in actually activated interferon gamma positive CD8 positive TILs in those tumors. So again, kind of showing, proving that these um, uh, CAR-Ms not only get to where they're supposed to go, but also actually impact T cells in the way that you might want them to. So this slide, the one that we do have up, shows um, the design, the schema of our phase one trial. Um, we initially planned to enroll 18 patients with HER2 positive cancers, although that number is going to change as we continue to modify our trial, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Patients do um, have to have had prior therapy. Uh, they are allowed to have had prior HER2 directed therapy if that's, uh, you know, if that's approved in there or considered um, rational by their treating physician, but they have to have a biopsy prior to enrolling in the, in the study to confirm that they remain HER2 amplified, either three plus or two plus with FISH. Um, and actually that's been one of the main um, uh, issues or things that we've discovered through the course of this trial is that up to 50% of them, perhaps even slightly more, will be HER2 negative by the time they get to us. So they have converted to a HER2 negative state. If they are HER2 positive, um, they undergo screening and then once confirmed to be eligible by other parameters, they get a nupogen um, you know, uh, uh, injections and then apheresis to collect their monocytes. After that phoresis, they get to go on any bridging therapy that's non-HER2 directed to stabilize their tumors. A lot of these are aggressive solid tumor cancers. You can't leave them off therapy for six weeks while you generate this CAR. And so we allow them to get chemotherapy or other treatments as long as they're not HER2 directed while they wait. Once the product is ready, as I mentioned, it's shipped back to the site, it's thawed at the bedside and it's then reinfused into the patient. And we have done um, studies to look at viability from that freeze-thaw cycle, and the CAR-Ms are over 90% viable when you get them back to the bedside. The first nine patients received their CAR-Ms in split dosing. The product was divided into two or three bags and given on, on uh, say, day one and three or day one, three, and five. There were no major safety events observed, and so now they're getting it all in one uh, bolus injection. And we are getting uh, an additional two serial peripheral blood samples for cytokines and, and other uh, monitoring parameters. We're getting tumor biopsies both prior to the um, uh, reinfusion, uh, one week after reinfusion of the car, and then again, four weeks, um, which allows us to study the dynamics of the product and also the changes in the tumor microenvironment. So to date, we've actually treated about 12 people, but the available public data right now only concerns the first seven. And really what you can see here, which is not a very big surprise, is that there are a broad number of histologies represented and that patients have um, been, um, you know, have had a lot of prior uh, therapies and many patients have had multiple uh, one or more HER2 directed uh, therapies as well. So in terms of toxicity, which is the primary endpoint of the study, along with feasibility, CAR-M has been very well tolerated. We've had a couple of patients get CRS, low grade, grade two. Nobody has required um, tocilizumab. Nobody has required pressors. Uh, it tends to resolve relatively quickly, which is, again, consistent with the idea that the macrophages are egressing from the bloodstream relatively quickly. No patient has had an AE that they've taken uh, come off the study for, and there have been no major organ toxicities um, to date. So this, um, this slide shows some of the uh, translational work that we're doing, so we're very excited about. 
So we have serial blood samples from patients, which is shown in the left panel that shows that all patients have basically the same profile. They get a peak of CT0505, sorry, CT0508 in their bloodstream about half an hour after infusion. And then that rapidly decreases as the um, CAR Ms disappear from the bloodstream, suggesting again, that they disappear um, out of the peripheral blood uh, as macrophages do. And then we used RNA scope technology to look for the cells at those post biopsies, right? So here you see on the right side, the screening biopsies where you should not see any of the product as the patient has not had it yet. And you see that it's consistent, uh, that you're consistent there. But we detected the CAR-Ms um, by RNA scope in six out of the seven patients that were treated. So what that means, and it was a big question, is do they get there? They get there. So that's important. They get to their target. The next question is, do they affect the microenvironment once they get to the tumor? And then also, how are they distributed throughout um, various uh, metastatic sites throughout the body? So the first question can be answered with the observation that T-cell clonality was found to be increased after CAR-M in five of six patients, which is shown there on the um, left side, indicating some adaptive anti-tumor immunity. Additional data, which I haven't shown today, shows that these T cells expand within the TME over time and adopt a cytotoxic phenotype, so exactly what you want. So we can conclude, at least for now, that the CAR-Ms reach their target um, and that they do modulate the TME. Whether that's sufficient to translate on its own into clinical efficacy is not yet totally clear. Um, at this time, or at least at the time of these seven patients, we'd only seen, we had seen stable disease as the best response. So no patient at this time has yet had a you know 30% or more shrinkage of their lesions. We have patients with stable disease. Um, but at least we know that the CAR-M is getting where it should go and uh, that it is affecting the tumors locally, at least those that we have biopsied. So overall, so far, uh, we've shown that this novel car and product is uh, can be successfully manufactured even from highly pre-treated patients. We get sufficient monocytes um, from their blood that can then be grown up into macrophages and generated into car M. Um, it's a highly viable cell product. As I told you, 90% at bedside or sorry, 90% of the cells are viable at the time of the bedside thaw. It can be successfully and safely administered. We do see mild CRS, but no DLTs or major, major organ uh, uh, damage has been seen. And finally, we are able to find the product in biopsies taken a week and four weeks after the infusion with T-cell clone expansion, suggesting that the product is inducing some anti-tumor immunity. So there are two really next exciting steps for this trial. The first is that preclinical data from Charisma has demonstrated that the co-administration of Pembro, so anti-PD-1, um, may make this product more clinically effective. And so the amendment is ready and is moving through the five institutions uh, rapidly. And so the next group of patients will be treated with both CAR-M plus um, Pembrolizumab every three weeks. And then second, we, you know, the question about where do these CAR-Ms go and tumor heterogeneity and in terms of HER2 uh, amplification, um, is hopefully going to be answered, or at least we'll get some insight, as we recently activated a sub-study at Penn that allows us to label a portion of the CAR-M product, so a label a par portion of the CT0508 CAR-M that's going to go back into the patient with something called zirconium-89, which then with serial PET scans will allow us to actually physically track the CAR-M through the body, hopefully giving us a much clearer view of that distribution. And we just enrolled our first patient after that, uh, since that sub-study has activated, which was maybe a week ago um, for that uh, this week. So we'll get, um, we got our first, we actually, uh, actually did two. We actually consented our first two patients to that sub-study this week. So hopefully that gives us more insight into where these um, cells are really going and are they honing to all the tumors? Are they going just to some tumors? Um, which will really be, I think, important as we move forward to try to make this therapy work um, effectively. Um, with that, I'll, I'll stop. This is, this is my acknowledgement slide. I could not work on all these crazy things without an extraordinary amount of support, um, both uh, in, in, in colleagues, wonderful colleagues, uh, research staff, uh, and of course, funding, and the CAR-M team, which is um, the Charisma team, and the other sites that are enrolling trials, which are the trial, which is uh, down there on the right-hand side. Um, I know questions are not yet, so with that, so that's my email address, and uh, I'll stop there. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you so much for that excellent talk and moving right along last, but certainly not least is Dr. Jeffrey Koo, who is an assistant attending physician at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. 
and specializes in the treatment of esophageal and gastric cancers. His research focuses on the use of immune therapy and upper GI malignancies. He graduated from the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and completed his internal medicine residency at New York Presbyterian Hospital at Weill Cornell and his medical oncology fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Dr. Koo. And thank you so much. And, and the, the preceding two talks were excellent. So I'm, I'm feeling uh, especially intimidated at this point. Um, it's, uh, you know, thank you for asking me to present on, on CAR T cells. And, you know, the, um, I think a year ago, I probably would not have uh, had a lot to talk about. Uh, but I, I, and potentially in one or two years, you know, there may be much more to talk about. So I think this really is kind of the takeoff point for these therapies in solid tumors in general, but especially in esophageal gastric cancer, which I treat. So these are my disclosures. So I'll start actually with a brief introduction about CAR T cells. And, you know, Dr. Ho did a great job on, on focusing on the challenge of finding targets in solid tumors. But I wanted to take a step back and talk about CAR T cells uh, therapy in general, because I think unless, you know, we, I, I think this is probably something that's foreign to most solid tumor oncologists, and even for hematologic oncologists, unless you're actually, a, you know, actually give cellular therapies, um, uh, you know, a lot of this is somewhat, you know, mysterious. So clearly, we've heard about CAR T cells for more than a decade now, uh, and CAR stands for chimeric antigen receptor. And this uh, cartoon really kind of breaks down very elegantly the three components of the CARs. Um, the, certainly the, one of the most important uh, element in terms of tumor specificity is the antigen binding ectodomain, which is on the outside uh, of the plasma membrane. And this gives it the specificity for a tumor associated antigen. Uh, there is then a middle section, kind of a spacer that basically anchors um, the entire construct of the plasma membrane. And then internally, there's kind of the business, part, the business end of it. Uh, Dr. Ho talked a little bit about this, but this normally involves a CD3 signaling component, which really you know, signals, signals activation of the T cells. But what's also equally important is that we need to include a co-stimulation domain. So normally, T cells actually require two signals in order to be activated. One is through the, the, uh, the, the T cell receptor. But the second is a, an additional signal that's required to activate the T cells. And in fact, if you only activate uh, through the T cell receptor without the second signal, uh, you risk making the T cell energic or inactive. And this presumably is a mechanism to protect against autoimmunity. So this essentially, so these are the three components of, of the CARs, uh, which are transfected you know, virally into T cells. So again, I think we've heard a lot about uh, CAR T cell therapy and hematologic malignancies. Uh, and it's really transformed the treatment of those cancers. Patients essentially with incurable diseases are now routinely cured 50, 60, 70% of the time with these therapies. Now, of note, the, the reason that these therapies have worked is that they've really focused primarily on two antigens at this point in terms of FDA-approved therapies, CD19 and BCMA. And again, these are antigens that are exquisitely specific for the tumor cells and not for normal cells. And that specificity is really important in our search for the ideal antigen, because otherwise we would risk creating um, an autoimmune or kind of a profound immune-mediated toxicity. Now, having said that, we also all recognize that CAR T cells on their own uh, have innate toxicities, uh, which can be challenging. And certainly in the early days of these therapies, uh, unfortunately, there were, there were you know, grade five events deaths, and which, which still can occur. So the two toxicities that I'll discuss briefly for the benefit of, 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 of those of us who don't routinely give CAR T cell therapies are, are CRS, cytokine release syndrome, and it's a, it's a distinct um, uh, but related phenomenon called ICANS, or Immune Effective Cell Associated Neurotoxicity Syndrome. So here I, I've kind of put up the, the grading system for, for both of these, and on the top there is the grading for CARS, uh, for, sorry, for CRS. So CRS basically refers to, you know, a fever that can be seen in the immediate period uh, following uh, CAR T cell infusion, anywhere from two to maybe, you know, seven to 10 days. Uh, grade one CRS consists of fever without other associated symptoms, but as, as the reaction gets more severe, uh, patients can experience hypotension, they can experience hypoxia. Uh, you can also see a range of lab abnormalities in terms of renal and liver dysfunction. Uh, and certainly, you know, this requires very, very prompt recognition as well as treatment. The treatment consists normally of um, therapies against IL-6 or IL-6 receptor. So um, Dr. Dr. Rice had mentioned uh, tocilizumab. 
Uh, we also give steroids as a last resort. We generally try to avoid steroids because steroids are extremely lymphotoxic and essentially can kill the CAR T cells. So below that is, 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 what's, is, is again what's called ICANS, which basically is neurologic toxicity caused by the CAR T cell therapy. Uh, it actually can be very, very mild. Uh, so one of the things we ask patients to do every morning is actually to kind of write um, a sentence on a piece of paper. And one of the most subtlest um, manifestations is that people find that their handwriting is altered uh, or they have, difficulty, uh, yeah, they have difficulty writing. I had another patient uh, who on some days uh, had difficulty uh, counting back by sevens. Some days it was perfect, some days it was a little bit more difficult. But certainly, if, if ICANS becomes more serious, patients can become completely abundant, uh, they can experience seizures, uh, and this requires very prompt treatment with steroids. So with this in mind, and kind of having set the stage for, for the, you know, what CAR T-cells are and some of the toxicities associated with CAR T-cell therapy, I'll talk about you know, the uh, one target, and certainly the main target that's being evaluated in esophagastric cancers at this point, which is Claudin 18.2. Uh, I know that my colleague, Dr. Marin, gave a talk uh, earlier this morning. I uh, unfortunately had to miss it because I'm here in clinic, uh, but I think he did talk briefly about this target already. So this is uh, a cartoon. This cartoon actually is taken from, um, from the uh, presentation of the study in 2016. Uh, and I mentioned 2016 for a specific reason that I'll come back to. But uh, Claudin 18.2 uh, is a member of the Claudin family. But basically what it is, it's that it's a component of the tight junctions. And that's something that helps essentially cells to stick together, helps to maintain the polarity of cells, helps to maintain the impermeability of cells. So Claudin 18.2 is, is broadly expressed in multiple cancers. Uh, it's, exposed, it's expressed in esophageal gastric cancer. Uh, it's exposed in pancreas cancer as, as well as uh, in biliary tract cancer. Uh, and very, very importantly, it's not expressed or only minimally expressed on the vast majority of healthy tissue. Uh, and again, this is this is a this is a um, this is necessary uh, if we're considering this for a cellular therapy. So, so uh, Claudin eighteen point two first came to light um, when um, this fast study was presented at ASCO in twenty sixteen. Uh, this was a study done by the German group, and it was a randomized phase two study uh, of the EOX chemotherapy regimen, a chemotherapy regimen that's no longer you know, used much in first line, with or without zobituximab, which is an antibody that binds to Claudin 18.2. The study enrolled any patients with esophageal gastric adenocarcinoma, uh, and, there was, and Claudin positivity was defined based on an immunohistochemistry assay, uh, and this was the um, definition that was used for the purpose of this study. So the study met its primary endpoint, and you can see on the kaplan meier curve on, on the left, uh, clear separation in PFS. Uh, in addition, it also actually led to improvements in overall survival, uh, which is impressive for a randomized phase two study, and there was also an approximate 15% improvement in response rate. A uh, little bit of trivia, the, stu the, the study actually was finally published um, in the Annals of, of Oncology uh, last year. Uh, the first author, Dr. Sahin, uh, he is um, one half of the couple uh, behind, behind BioNTech uh, who came up with the Moderna mRNA vaccine. So they certainly have their you know, fingers in, in many pies and have made you know, very, very significant contributions uh, to oncology and to the world of infectious disease. So again, the, I, I mentioned that the original data were presented in, in 2016. Um, subsequently, the, the drug was acquired by a Japanese company, Astalis. They then subsequently launched and ran a phase three study known as Spotlight, uh, which was a um, straightforward iteration of first-line Fulfox with or without Zobituximab. Um, I mentioned here that the study has completed accrual uh, and that the primary endpoint is overall survival. Uh, since I submitted these slides, uh, we actually got a, had a press release on Wednesday that Spotlight actually met its primary endpoint. The primary endpoint, uh, I, I was mistaken, is actually progression-free survival, but the secondary endpoint of overall survival improvement was also met. Uh, so presumably these data will be reported soon, potentially at GI ASCO in January, uh, and this certainly it will likely become practice changing. So. The fact that the original randomized phase two study was reported in 2016, uh, and we only just now have a completed phase three study, means that there has been a lot of interest in anti claudin therapeutics. And in fact, there are bispecifics, there are novel antibodies, and of course, there is CT041, uh, which is a CAR T cell based on, uh, based on claudin 18.2. 
so I think many may be aware of this um, uh, of this com of of this uh, product uh, based on uh, an important publication in Nature Medicine. Uh, the data were again also reported at ASCO this past June. So here on the right, you see the construct, and again, it's consistent with uh, the general constructs of of CARS. Uh, the antibody component is against Claudin eighteen point two. And the uh, internal component com consists of uh, both a um, CD3 as well as a CD28 uh, co-stimulation kind of um, uh, domains. So these were the data that were published in Nature Medicine earlier this year of the phase one study. Uh, overall, 37 patients uh, were included in the manuscript. 28 of them had gastric cancer. And they were treated at one of three flat doses of Claudin 18.2. I would note that the highest dose that patients received was five times 10 to the eight cells, which is less than the dose that's being used in ongoing studies in the US. Uh, the vast majority, 95% of patients had um, uh, CRS, cytokine release syndrome, uh, but all of these events were grade one and two, uh, and there were no grade three events. Um, consistent with that, about three quarters of patients received tocilizumab, which is an antibody against IL-6 receptor. Uh, and a small number of patients receive steroids. Again, like I said, un as much as possible, we try to avoid steroids uh, because they can be you know, uh, very, very lymphotoxic. Uh, what, what's reassuring about this product was that they did not see any ICANs in this small group of patients that were treated. So this is the study schema that I, that I put up that is also the ongoing in, in, um, uh, with, with current studies. Uh, and, and I think, again, it's important uh, to allow for bridging therapy uh, in the time that it takes to set up the leukophoresis and in the anywhere from four to five weeks that it takes uh, to actually produce the CAR T cells. And, and indeed, the study does allow for bridging therapy uh, before the CAR T cell infusion. Uh, I would just mention also to, to um, uh, those of us who are not familiar that normally prior to administering CAR T cells, we normally administer what's called preconditioning therapy or lymphodepleting therapy. This normally consists of regimens of drugs such as flu, uh, fludarabine and, and cyclophosphamide. The idea is that this uh, knocks down a patient's own T cells. And in that kind of depleted, T cell depleted environment, patients receive the CAR T cells. It's thought that this facilitates engraftment of the CAR T cells. It's also possible that regulatory T cells, which are immunosuppressive, are eliminated by the lymphodepleting chemotherapy. So, these are the results. So this is the one table of results in the Nature Medicine um, uh, manuscript. Uh, the response rate was 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 quite uh, was quite. Uh, and this is in the gastric cancer patients. The response rate was was an impressive sixty percent, uh, and and an additional um, uh, seventeen or eighteen percent of patients had stable disease. So that the overall disease control rate um, was um, was um, seventy five percent. Uh, median progression free survival was 4.2 months. That's difficult to interpret without knowing whether there's any durability. Uh, similarly, the six month overall survival rate was encouraging at 80%, uh, and six month duration of response uh, was 53%. Again, hard to know what to make of that without knowing whether there is uh, a tail at the end of the curve. So, again, at ASCO, uh, subsequently in a poster presentation, um, there was a separate cohort of these patients who were treated that was also presented. So again, same drug, uh, but, but different cohort of patients than the patients who were treated in the Nature Medicine um, manuscript. Here they report on the results for 14 patients with, a soft, well, with gastric and GE junction cancer who were treated. Um, in this case, seven patients actually were able to receive a second CAR T cell infusion, and I'll discuss the rationale for that in the next couple of slides. Um, the, um, um, the demographics are, are worth noting that there is a significant proportion of patients who have diffuse gastric cancer, a significant proportion who have signet ring cell cancer, and in fact, 90% of patients have peritoneal carcinomatosis. This is noteworthy because there is a thought that Claudin 18.2 expression uh, is slightly higher in diffuse gastric cancers than in intestinal gastric cancers, although certainly it's also present in intestinal gastric cancers. Uh, and this actually has strong therapeutic implications, partly because we don't have good therapies at all for diffuse gastric cancers. Most diffuse gastric cancers are genomically stable by the TCGA subset, which means that they have low tumor mutation burden. Uh, there are not a lot, lot of targets. Um, they're typically not HER2 positive, and they typically also have a low PDL1 CPS. So we actually desperately need therapies uh, for this subset of gastric cancer, and certainly it would be an additional boon uh, if diffuse gastric cancers are enriched for Claudin 18.2. So 
In terms of safety, again, I, the, I think this subset uh, confirmed the results of the earlier subset um, uh, in that it is a relatively safe combination. Uh, here, uh, in fact, all patients experience cytokine release syndrome, and in, and in comparison to the first data set, uh, the vast majority actually were grade two, and in fact, one patient actually did develop grade three cytokine release syndrome. But again, reassuringly, there actually was uh, no ICANS um, that was observed at all. Uh, in, in the earliest phase one studies, there actually was some diffuse gastric mucosal bleeding when patients were treated, and that's because um, Claudin 18.2 is expressed at very, very low levels in normal gastric mucosa, uh, but that was not seen in this uh, later cohort of patients that were treated. Here we finally see kind of more detailed efficacy results. I think in terms of um, ORR, it actually is very similar to the original data set that was presented. Uh, response rates of almost um, of almost um, sixty percent, and a disease control rate of between seventy five to eighty percent. Here, for the first time, we do see the Kaplan Meier curves in terms of progression free survival as well as overall survival. PFS is on the left; overall survival is on the right. And here, I think it's very much a situation of whether it's a glass half full or glass half empty. If you look at the PFS, it does not seem like there is any durability, and ultimately most, it seems like the vast majority of patients will eventually experience progression. And similarly, in terms of overall survival at this point, it does not seem to be any long-term survival. Uh, I think, uh, you know, my editorialization is that it's absolutely noteworthy, you know, that we have proof of principle, you know, that this treatment can be safe and can be effective, but the question moving forward is how can we further improve the efficacy? So part of the uh, answer to that question may lie in this particular graph in terms of the pharmacokinetics. Here they looked at the persistence of the CAR T cells after the first infusion, and again after the second infusion, and as I, as I had mentioned, seven out of the 14 patients received a second infusion. And in both cases, you see that the median persistence time is about 30 days, meaning that after 30 days, um, the CAR T cells you know, disappear uh, for many patients which really leads to the question of whether we can improve the outcome by giving repeated injections. So finally, what was presented at ASCO was also the U.S. experience. So um, the first two data sets were patients who were treated in China, but as of May, 14 patients had been treated in the U.S., five with gastric cancer and nine with pancreas cancer. The one thing I would note is that patients are receiving higher doses than we than we than we use in China. So patients are now receiving six times ten to the eight, up from five times ten to the eight, which is the maximal dose that was tested in China. And again, it, it is relatively safe. There is no grade three cytokine release syndrome, uh, no ICANS, and at least in this data set, a relatively small number of patients require tocilizumab. Uh, and at least based on ORR, you know, we see here a response rate of 60%, which is very in line with the data that we've already seen from China. So this is the ongoing phase two study. Um, this, it's an ongoing study of 80 patients. Um, it's currently focused on treating patients with gastric and GE junction cancer. So key eligibility criteria in, include Claudin 18.2 positivity by a central IHC, IHC assay. And based on the positivity criteria, that translates to about 70% of patients, so most patients are eligible. Uh, the plan for the study is for patients to undergo leukophoresis while they are receiving second line or greater therapy, and then to receive CAR T cell infusion as third line or greater therapy. Uh, all patients are receiving a flat dose of six times 10 to the eight cells. As I alluded to, we may be able to you know, uh, extend the benefit of this treatment uh, by administering uh, additional CAR T cell infusions. So there's a second plan infusion at month three to four, as well as a third infusion at month six to 10, uh, provided that patients have tolerated treatment, provided that patients are deriving benefit. Uh, the primary endpoint of the study is ORR, and but there are also clearly important secondary endpoints, uh, including PFS and overall survival. So I'll turn next to another target, uh, MAGE A4, uh, which, which, which um, may be unfamiliar to many people. So as a background, uh, there is a group of antigens called cancer testis antigens, which are normally expressed, as the name would suggest, only on cancer cells, as well as testis and ovarian tissue. Uh, their function actually is not known, but again, the specificity of their expression really makes them ideal uh, for immunotherapy approaches, including cellular therapies. 
So, in, so MAGE A4 is a CT antigen, and it's expressed not very commonly, but it's expressed in about 15 to 20 percent of esophageal adenocarcinomas and approximately one third of esophageal squamous cell cancers. So the cellular product that I'm going to talk about is actually not a CAR, but, include, but involves a T cell receptor. So, uh, so because of that, I wanted to show a cartoon um, that, that will remind all of us of kind of basic immunology. So basically, here we see a peptide. In this case, it's a, uh, it's a peptide from an intracellular you know, um, cancer protein that's expressed in the, in the context of MHC class 1 molecule, which facilitates um, presentation of intracellular uh, peptides. This is then recognized by a specific T cell receptor on a CD8 cell, which then becomes activated. So, uh, you know, the, um, the interaction uh, between the specific MHC molecule and the peptide and the T cell receptor, all three of these things are very, very specific. Um, you know, there are multiple MHC molecules, they are inherited, and that polymorphism um, leads to multiple phenomena, including, you know, immune response repertoire and even predisposition to autoimmunity. So this is a uh, product from a company called Adaptimmune, and it's A2M4CD8. So basically what it is, it's, um, it's, it's a product uh, that's transduced into autologous CD4 and CD8 T cells using a lentivirus vector and it expresses a mage A4 specific T cell receptor as well as a CD8 alpha co-receptor. Uh, the T cell re receptor, of course, uh, targets and engages mage A4 in the cancer cells and activates the T cells. And based on this cartoon, it's thought that the CD8 um, alpha co-receptor also impacts T cell receptor binding on CD4 cells, so that CD4 cells are normally helper T cells. They normally don't have a cytolytic function, but based on this, um, based on this construct, CD4 cells can also start killing uh, tumor cells. So notably, the T cell receptor itself is engineered to recognize a very specific MAGE A4 peptide. It's a MAGE A4 peptide in the context of the HLAAO2 uh, MHC molecule. So HLAAO2 um, is, is found in about 30% of, of, uh, of, of the white population. So again, uh, this is a study also that's further restricted uh, based, on, based on this requirement for this HLA type. So uh, phase one uh, results for, for this uh, product was presented in the SURPASS uh, phase one study. Uh, this was recently updated at ESMO uh, using a data cutoff from August of this year. So 44 patients have been treated. And if you take a quick look at the toxicities, with regard to cytokine release syndrome, it's seen some, somewhat in the realm of the CTO41 product that I just presented, although there was a notable percentage of patients who have grade three cytokine release syndrome, you know, which is really you know, a scary phenomenon that requires pressure and even as repressors and even kind of ventilatory uh, support. Um, in addition, 7% uh, of patients had ICANs, with 5% of patients having grade three or more ICANs, you know, which is also a very scary phenomenon. Um, many patients received anti-IL-6 uh, receptor therapy, uh, and not unexpectedly, one quarter of patients have prolonged cytopenias week four post-infusion, post which is largely a, a product of the lymphodepleting chemotherapy that I had mentioned. Now, unfortunately, there were two grade five events on this study. Uh, one patient uh, was, was thought to have died from pneumonia and cytokine release syndrome. Uh, the other patient actually had prolonged bone marrow failure and pancytopenia, and uh, pancytopenia following um, CAR T cell therapy is actually a phenomenon that's not extremely well understood. It's thought to be related maybe to kind of the inflammatory response from the CAR T cells, kind of wiping out, um, wiping out the bone marrow. So um, uh, of the 12 patients with esophageal cancer who were treated on this study, um, um, there were about 17% um, of patients had partial response. 67% uh, had stable disease, so they're overall about 85% of patients had disease control. Uh, at this time, there has not been information uh, provided about the durability of these responses, but certainly some clinical activity. So on the basis of this, um, the SURPASS phase two study, sorry, the SURPASS two phase two study was launched. Uh, it's a study of, of 45 patients uh, specifically focused on esophageal and GE junction cancer, so no gastric cancer, but it does allow esophageal squamous cell cancer. As I mentioned, patients have to be both HLA AO2 positive, so that's about one third of the population, and then also MAGE A4 IHC positive, 20% uh, of the adenos, one third of squamous cell cancers. So this is really a much more restricted population uh, than, for example, the Claudin 18.2 study. 
Uh, similar design, patients are leukophoresis during the second line of therapy, and they receive CAR T cells during third line therapy. Primary endpoint is objective response rate. Now, uh, unfortunately, last week, uh, we, we, we received notification that the study uh, has, has, uh, has stopped accruing. And that's likely because of the very slow accrual rate, because of the need for HLA restriction, and because of the relatively low level of MAJ4 expression. Uh, it's been difficult to identify these patients. Nevertheless, uh, such patients, you know, esophageal gastric cancer patients, can still be enrolled on the ongoing um, surpass, the original surpass study. Uh, the final target I, I, I was going to talk about um, is something um, that uh, Dr. Rice completely uh, um, uh, has gone over, and she did an excellent job. And actually, I learned a lot from her presentation. So, in fact, I was going to talk about CTO five zero eight as a HER two therapy, um, a, again using a CAR macrophage. So in the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll essentially kind of um, ask a couple of provocative questions that hopefully she can answer during the kind of Q&A session. Um, you know, clearly one toxicity that we'll, we'll have to watch out for is cardiac toxicity. So we know that there is low level HER2 expression on, 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 on cardiac tissue. We know, of course, that, you know, cardiomyopathy is a known toxicity of HER2 therapies. So clearly, I think this is something that we'll have to be watched for closely. You know, at this point in time, I think the, you know, the data are preliminary. Uh, I think the plan to add it to pembrolizumab you know, will generate more data. But ultimately, I think we'll have to see you know, how durable these responses are. We'll have to see certainly whether they're partial responses to know whether this is a therapy that will be able to move forward or not. Uh, I would add that you know, the HER2 space has become extremely crowded in the last couple of years, not only with you know, recent FDA approvals, but with other kind of experimental strategies as well. And there are, certainly are other um, uh, cellular therapies directed against HER2 uh, that, that are also coming down the pipe. So really, in, in, in conclusion, um, you know, cellular therapies in solid tumors, including in esophageal gastric cancer, really are in, in the infancy. I do think that the ongoing study with CT04, CT041, where we plan to enroll 80 patients, um, will be more than just proof of principle, but it really will be, you know, a, 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 a reasonable assessment, both of activity as well as safety of the approach. I think ultimately, irrespective of, you know, whatever activity we see, I think we really always have to factor in the very significant costs. Um, you know, the, the pretty dramatic and frightening toxicities associated with these drugs, as well as the logistics involved in, in preparing and administering these treatments to patients, uh, we really will have to balance any kind of clinical efficacy um, against all of these factors to determine whether there will be a role for uh, any of these therapies in esophageal gastric and other solid tumors. Uh, as with Dr. Ho, I would certainly encourage fit and motivated patients to enroll on these studies. Uh, and I certainly would uh, encourage everyone also to say, stay tuned for this space. I think in the next couple of years, uh, I think there'll be a lot more data to present. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I think we have four minutes for questions. I'm gonna do the first one for Dr. Ho. I think you mentioned in passing, we've talked a lot about recently how toxic these constructs can be. And so when we're designing them, um, you mentioned passing a kill switch or an off switch that you're trying to add to the car design. Can you talk briefly about how that works and what drugs are used to, to facilitate the off switch? So I'm sorry, I, I think you are asking the how the off switch works in the CAR T construct. Is that the question? Yes. Yes. Uh, so we introduce uh, there the we and other labs uh, try to introduce kind of safety switch in the CAR T cells because of the cytokine storm and other potential side effect. And, uh, and the some of the CAR T cells may have on target off tumor effect. So you, we want to be very careful. And obviously the target, for example, I talk about GPC2. If we start to run clinical trial next year, that will be the first uh, uh, CAR T uh, therapy targeted this particular tumor energy. We haven't tested in any trial. Uh, before. So that would be the first time testing human. Obviously, we have to be careful. So that off switch is uh, EGFR truncated form. And uh, that is only uh, keep, so we only keep the epitope recognized by setuzumab, which is FDA approved drug. And by doing that, and uh, we could inject the setuzumab to remove CAR T cells if they have any severe side effect in, in patients. So it will not I would say it will not immediately 
uh, eliminated the cytokine storm because cytokine storm can be modulated and managed uh, in the clinic. We see some very severe cytokine storm in other trials, not in, in the CAR T cell we developed this here, but it in general could be managed and uh, has been shown in CAR Jones lab and other labs. But I think what I'm talking about is more like uh, the, the, the uh, untargeted off tumor effect, potentially maybe in some CAR T cells, we might want to remove it for long-term effect. And that we use cetuximab to, we could successfully remove them. In preclinical study, if we use cetuximab, we can remove them completely in mice and we couldn't detect any CAR T cells, for example, in the blood. Dr. He, you had a question. So, Dr. Ho, the question is about the therapeutic target of, of GPC3 in the light of negative antibody studies and the selection of the target for the construct. Uh, can you repeat the sentence again? I'm not sure I uh, fully understand it. So I think the question was, there's the selection of the target for the CAR-T. Dr. He was saying there's been some negative studies using GPC3 antibodies for those disease types. So how important is that specifically as the selection for your CAR target? Yes. So you are talking about how we select the target like the GPC3 or GPC2 in, for CAR-T therapy. Yeah. So we obviously in early days, we use microarray to narrow down to the gene that are highly expressed in cancer uh, in low or non-expression in the normal tissues. And now we have a single cell RNA sick. We could do even more single cell uh, expression and uh, try to identify those targets. But ultimately, uh, we might see a lot of RNA sick data and uh, to validate target is uh, really a lot of work. So that's why we don't really see many targets like GPC3 and GPC2 in solid tumors. I think in part is because it takes years and a lot of laboratory work to try to validate uh, the target, which is a high risk. You could argue it's high rewarding, but it's definitely a high risk project. And uh, so that, that takes a lot of efforts. And uh, by doing that, you have to identify anybody as we did and or different epitope on the target to be able to show what, it's not only just killing the tumors, but it also has a low background or no background on normal tissues. And uh, so not only show antibody binding on the tissue array, we normally have to show CAR T cells on the primary normal cells and whether they can kill or not, or maybe antigen negative uh, tumor cells, whether they could have any side effects on those cells. Now, ultimately in patients, we have to carefully follow those try and to see how they actually, not only just a shrink the tumor, but they may have other side effect, maybe related to the same unknown expression in, in, uh, in humans. So obviously this is an ongoing study from preclinical to clinical to validate uh, tumor specific antigens. And uh, that is why it is very rare and very, very few solid tumor targets have been identified and being validated uh, in, the, in the lab and also in the clinic. And Dr. Ho, very briefly, there was an online question about um, GPC and biliary tract uh, cancers. You talked about HCC and, and PANK. What about biliary cancers? Uh, what about the what? The, G, the GPC expression in biliary cancers, is it a target? In, uh, in other cancer, not only liver cancer. Well, in, in non-HCC liver cancer, like biliary tract cancers. I see, okay. No, uh, we actually look uh, in liver cancer, there are major two types. One is uh, HCC, the other is a cholangial carcinoma. In early years, we looked at uh, uh, liver cancer, both types. Uh, GPC3 is only in the uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. It's also expressed in childhood hepatoblastoma. And, uh, and I'm not sure we actually tag uh, 
carefully analyze every single subset of the uh, uh, liver cancer uh, types. But I think in general, GPC3 is highly expressed in capital cellular carcinoma, hepatoblastoma, and, uh, but not in cholangial carcinoma, that's for sure. And in cholangial carcinoma, we actually study a target called mesocillin. It's a highly in cholangial carcinoma, but not in, in any HCC. So that mesocillin is another good target for liver cancer, uh, actually more focused on intrahepatic uh, uh, cholangial carcinoma, which is very hard uh, cancer uh, to kill. And uh, we have actually developing a mesocillin car T uh, uh, cells and going to run a clinical trial in NIH to start with mesocilioma because mesocilioma has the highest mesocilin expression. But eventually this trial will benefit cholangial carcinoma patients if we can show safety and efficacy in mesocilioma, ovarian cancer, and maybe pancreatic cancer. But cholangial carcinoma uh, might be the next after we, we, we test on mesocilioma patients first because they are more uniform and more high expression on mesocilioma patients. But uh, cholangial car carcinoma does have a very high expression on mesocilin, but no GPC3 in cholangial carcinoma. Thank you. And very last question, because we're over time for Dr. Rice and then Dr. Ku. Do we need the lymphodepletion? So we talked about this, you know, for the CAR T constructs. These are not bone marrow transplants. How important is that? And, you know, should we just have some other way of trying to get rid of the Tregs alone? So definitely, there are some study indicating the uh, lymphodepletion. Sorry, Dr. How we were asking the other oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Jeff, you want to go first? Or you want me to go first? Um, Please go ahead. Yeah, I I, um, I actually was curious to see what Dr. Ho was going to say. So I can I can I can give Dr. Ho my turn because the the um, the CAR M the, the CT zero five zero eight does not we are not requiring lymphodepletion. So there is no uh, uh, myeloablative conditioning regimen for for those patients. Um, but I actually was also curious what Dr. Ho would say. I I, I, I think we actually I mean I would say the same thing. I mean as far as I know. I mean, I think kind of by convention, we've done that, but you know, I think the, um, for, for those in the audience who don't know, there actually is a national shortage of sudarabine. So we, so, so, you know, outside of studies, we, you know, we've actually used other lymphodepleting regimens and at least in, early on, it seems to not have compromised, you know, engraftment or activity. Um, and then I would just add for good measure that the CTO41 study, in addition to fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, which are standard, they also added um, nab paclitaxel um, for unclear reasons. So, so I, I, I think that this is certainly an, uh, an issue that from a clinical perspective uh, is somewhat empiric and, and, and I don't know that we have great data for one way or the other. Um, so, so Dr. Ho, if you, if you have some other insight, please share. Dr. Ho, you wanna weigh in and then we'll transition. <laughs> yeah, no, I actually I agree. <laughs> So, so actually, I totally agree. I think the, it's, a, it's a not very clear whether the lymphodepletion has a, a big impact on the CAR-T therapy. So I can only say in our current GPC-3 CAR-T trial in NIH, we do lymphodepletion and, uh, for, for our trial. And uh, there are some indications lymphodepletion might be helpful, as you just mentioned, to remove CENTREG and other in the solid tumor microenvironment. But I don't think there's strong evidence to support that. Thank you all. Thank you.